In this unit, we focus on the reaction known as hydroboration oxidation of alkynes. The name of this reaction, hydroboration oxidation, should ring some bells related back to alkenes because we also talked about hydroboration oxidation of alkenes where we were able to convert alkenes into alcohols and we did this going opposite Marx's rule. So we added the H to the more alkyl substituted carbon and we added the OH to the less alkyl substituted carbon. Now as we take a look at this reaction for alkynes, what we're going to see is that we will first do an opposite Markovnikov's rule addition of H2O across the carbon-carbon triple bond, but then from there we'll take the enol intermediate that results from that and we'll do the process known as keto-enol tautomerization in order to convert the hydroxy group into a carbonyl group. So let's go ahead and get started looking at this reaction. So we'll go ahead and look at our starting material, prop one ine reacted with BH3, borane. You'll also sometimes see this written as B2H6, the dimer form. And we describe this as the hydroboration phase of the reaction. So the step one is hydroboration. We put the number one there to indicate that the hydroboration step has to take place first before we add the oxidation reagents. So the peroxide and sodium hydroxide, namely. So what's going to happen here, whenever you see borane, followed by peroxide and sodium hydroxide, is that we are going to be adding H and OH across the carbon-carbon triple bond, going opposite Marx's rule. So add H and OH to the alkyne, going opposite Marx's rule. So this is a regioselective reaction, and the regioselectivity is going to be opposite Markovnikov's rule. So I'll go ahead and make that annotation that this is a regioselective process. We're going to have a preference for a certain stereo, certain constitutional isomer at the end of this reaction. So adding H and OH across the carbon-carbon triple bond is going to take our three-carbon chain that had a triple bond in it, leave it with a carbon-carbon double bond, and at those two carbon atoms, one of those is going to pick up an H, one's going to pick up an OH, and we'll place the OH on the more on the less substituted carbon and the H on the more substituted carbon. So that's what we mean when we say going opposite Marx's rule is that the OH adds to the less alkyl substituted carbon. The H adds to the more substituted carbon. So keeping that in mind, that implies to us that we better be putting the OH group here at the end because that's our carbon atom that has more hydrogens and fewer alkyl groups. In other words, it's less alkyl substitute. And our hydrogen is going to go over here on the other carbon of what was originally the carbon-carbon triple bond. Now we should recognize that the functional group that we observe here after this regioselective addition reaction would be described as an enol, an alkene that has an alcohol group directly bonded to the one of the alkene carbons. So enols, as we had mentioned in a prior segment, are generally relatively unstable and will tautomerize to form a much more stable keto form constitutional isomer. So I'm going to show the equilibrium arrow here and lead us down along the way to the so-called keto form. The keto form of the molecule is going to correspond to replacing the hydroxy group with a carbonyl group and getting rid of the carbon-carbon double bond. So we'll have a three carbon chain here. And at that terminal end of the chain where we had the hydroxy group originally, now we'll have a carbonyl group. And since it's at the very end, it's going to have a hydrogen directly bonded there because the particular carbon that we're looking at is this one right here. Since it's at the end, to fill that octet, it has a hydrogen there to start with in addition to the OH group, and so that hydrogen is going to end up right here at the end. So we end up actually, in this case, making an aldehyde functional group in our product. Still, this process is called keto-enol tautomerization nonetheless, even though the keto term admittedly is being used a little bit loosely here because this really isn't a ketone. It's just a molecule of the carbonyl group. It's more specifically an aldehyde, but the name keto-enol tautomerization is what's ascribed to this. I don't make the rules. I just enforce them. So 
with regard to making this keto form, let's take a look at how that keto molecule is going to form. In the previous segment, we looked at the tautomerization process taking place in acid. In this case though, when we look at step two of the reaction mechanism, instead of having acid, we have sodium hydroxide present. So there's not going to be acidic conditions available here to promote this ketoenol tautomerization process. What will happen instead of those acid catalyzed conditions for ketoenol tautomerization is we'll instead use the base, the NaOH, as our catalyst of this reaction. So looking at the mechanism for ketoenol tautomerization now under basic conditions in this particular reaction, because that's what we have available there in the reaction mixture is NaOH, we're going to use that as our base to carry out this tautomerization process. So what's going to happen here in the ketoenol tautomerization? Well, bases love to grab protons and they're gonna to choose to grab a proton such that we can create the most stable intermediate possible from that. And the proton they're gonna remove is gonna be this proton right here. So in order to show that process happening, I'm gonna draw out that proton explicitly with our OH bond there. And the reason this proton is going to be targeted by the base is because when we remove the proton there, we're gonna end up creating an oxygen anion, which is definitely more stable than creating a carbon anion at some other place within this molecule because an oxygen is definitely better able to handle having that negative formal charge. So we're gonna remove a proton from the most susceptible place, the place where we can make the most stable product as a result of the acid-base reaction. So we'll bring in the hydroxide anion. It'll attack our proton there on the oxygen that forces the oxygen-hydrogen bond to break and the electrons from that bond to go on to the oxygen. So we'll call this step one and we would call this step a deprotonation step because as a result of this step, the organic molecule is losing a proton. So let's go ahead and then write out the intermediate that would result from this step. So carbon-carbon double bond in place. We've got our oxygen atom here. We broke the oxygen-hydrogen bond, so we put a lone pair on the oxygen. That's going to cause the oxygen there to have a negative formal charge, and we'll also end up generating water as a result of this step as well. So now what will happen next is that we will end up doing a protonation step to reform the base catalyst. So we're gonna protonate then the organic molecule. In the process of that, we'll reform the base catalyst. And what do we have here that can act as within the organic molecule as source of base to get us to the final observed product, that ketone product, we have a pi bond, which we've just demonstrated before that pi bonds can act as bases. So the pi bond is gonna come over, grab a proton from the water, which will act as our acid in this case. We just need something that can donate a proton here. And the only thing I really see that can donate a proton readily is going to be water. And the other benefit of this is that's going to allow us to recreate the, ox the hydroxide anion allowing the hydroxide anion to be defined as a catalyst of this reaction, which it is. So going through the electron pushing arrows here, that would give us hydroxide anion product as a result of this step, which illustrates how our hydroxide is used as a catalyst here because of the first step of the mechanism, we consumed it and now we've reformed it. So then the other organic molecule, the product that's gonna result from this step going to correspond to going like so. So I've remade my carbon skeleton and now I'm going to plug in the new proton. The new proton is going to go right here rather than at this other carbon on the right. And the reason why we choose to put the proton there is because what we will see is once we put in the positive formal charge right here, we can very readily show that the lone pair of electrons will come down like this to allow us to create the carbon-oxygen car carbon double bond here. So we'll end up with a CH3 at the end, CH2, and then right here we will have our CH and our carbon-oxygen double bond like so with two sets of lone pair electrons on it. And that third set of lone pair electrons is what came down and became the pi bond here. And it's very common, I should add, that we show steps two and what I've shown here as step three 
instead as a single step. So rather than showing that we have a carbocation and an oxygen anion adjacent to one another, it's super duper common and totally acceptable to instead just show that the oxygen lone pair electron is coming down that I'm showing there in blue at the same time that that pi bond is coming over and attacking water. And that would lead us straight to right here, straight to our final observed product of this reaction. Let's go ahead and do one more example problem to make sure that you have the hang of doing these hydroboration oxidation reactions for alkynes. So let's take a look at this problem. And as always, I encourage you to hit the pause button, make sure you can do this on your own, and then go th through the solution set to it. To solve this problem, predict the major products of the following reactions. We would say major products, we're referring to what's the major final product of the reaction. In order to get to that, I'm first going to write out what I would envision as the likely enol intermediate or intermediates, and then convert that into the so-called keto form. So our enol intermediate is gonna to correspond to copying down the same skeleton that we started with, and taking that carbon-carbon triple bond, converting it into a carbon-carbon double bond, and having added H and OH across the carbon-carbon double bond, going opposite Marx rule. So going opposite Marx rule, that means to me that we need to add the OH to our less alkyl substituted carbon, so the OH goes there on the end, H goes on the more alkyl substituted carbon. So that's going to give us our intermediate here. And then we'll need to convert that into the so-called keto form. Another thing I want to point out here right away is that you'll notice that we do have a chiral center that's specified here as a dash. And that chiral center is not reacting in the course of this reaction. You'll notice that all of the reaction action is taking place over here with the alkyne group. And so since that bond is not participating or acting in the reaction at all, we can just leave it as the same stereochemistry as what we started with. So I'm leaving it as a dash here because there's nothing going on to disrupt that stereochemistry. We're not breaking any of the bonds at that location or anything like that to change or alter that stereochemistry. So we'll just leave that as is and we kind of just ignore that it's even there. So then to go with the keto enol tautomerization to get us to the so-called keto form, Remember that what we need to do, you could do the mechanism for this if you wanted to walk yourself to this, but the shortcut is just to take the bond to the hydroxy group and convert it into a bond to a carbonyl. And then there's still that hydrogen there that was at the end right here is still there. So that's gonna mean that we have an aldehyde group here in the end case scenario. So this keto enol tautomerization yields an aldehyde and our final product I'll go ahead and put a box around here like so. So we would expect that to be the major organic product of the following reaction. And when we're looking at the stereochemistry, be sure that you get that stereochemistry there in as a dash because that part of the molecule is not participating in this reaction at all. And that happens to be the only chiral center that we have in the entire molecule because remember that the carbon oxygen double bond, that's going to be trigonal planar. So we don't have to worry about stereochemistry there at all. It will not be a stereocenter of any sort. So now that we've looked at the hydroboration oxidation reaction here, and we've also looked at the acid catalyzed hydration reaction in the previous segment, you now know two ways to go about taking an alkyne group and converting it into an aldehyde or ketone group. And so these are really useful reactions for manipulating functional groups because very commonly in things such as drug discovery and drug design, it's very desirable to take unfunctionalized carbons, meaning carbon atoms that are just part of hydrocarbon functional groups, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, and convert those into functional groups that contain heteroatoms because heteroatoms such as ketone groups are often very desirable as pharmacophores, the portions of, of drug molecules that confer the desired biological activity. So these are some very good reactions to be aware of and able to apply for purposes such as those.